On March 30th, demonstrators gathered outside the Chinese embassy in Washington, D.C., calling on the U.S. Congress to pass the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention and Human Rights Protection Acts. This legislation would ban the import of products alleged to be made from forced labor in China. It also authorizes President Biden to sanction anyone believed to be responsible for labor trafficking. Despite their tiny numbers, these protesters have a powerful force backing them, the U.S. government. Several of them are funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, an ostensible non-governmental organization which itself is funded by Congress. Over the last two decades, through the NED, the U.S. government has poured millions of dollars into a network of organizations advocating for a neo-Ottoman separatist state in China's Xinjiang province, what they call East Turkestan. Indeed, these Uyghur exiles pose as grassroots activists attempting to pressure the very same Congress that is funding their activities. Among them, Rushan Abbas. The Chinese regime is waging a war against humanity, against the basic rights God has given to us, and waging a war against our ethnicity and our religion. Her profile, now scrubbed from the internet, boasts of extensive experience working with U.S. government agencies, including Homeland Security, Department of Defense, Department of State, Department of Justice, and various U.S. intelligence agencies. Most famously, she worked as a translator for Uyghur detainees at the notorious Guantanamo Bay detention camp. Abbas also worked at Radio Free Asia, what the New York Times described as a worldwide propaganda network built by the CIA. Today, she heads the Campaign for Uyghurs, an organization funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. Also in attendance was El Fadar Iltabir, secretary of the Uyghur American Association. This is a subsidiary of the World Uyghur Congress, the main NED-funded organ of the separatist movement. The NED has granted millions of dollars to the World Uyghur Congress since its founding and gave it the Democracy Award in 2019. As the world has witnessed in the last decade, Chinese communists, instead of respecting one's religious beliefs and embracing the democracy, instead CCP become more racist, fascist, and tyrannical. Days before the rally, Iltabir took part in a Uyghur caravan denouncing a Stop Asian Hate rally. Fellow caravan participants shouted obscenities at the protesters. The director of the Uyghur American Association is Kuzat Altai. An investigation by Ajit Singh published in the Grey Zone revealed that Kuzat Altai and his brother Farooq have been trained by a former U.S. Army Ranger as part of a Uyghur militia called Altai Defense. Elfadar Iltabir's sister is El Nagar Iltabir, who in 2019 was appointed to be the Trump administration's director for China at the National Security Council. I asked Abbas and Iltabir about the allegations of a Uyghur genocide. More than 3 million Uyghurs are taken to concentration camps. So according to State Department, 2 million, and then Pentagon, 3 million Uyghurs. We believe it's uh, more than 3 million Uyghurs are in concentration camps in uh, East Turkestan. On Mike Pompeo's last day heading Donald Trump's State Department, he published a report accusing China of genocide and claiming more than 1 million civilians are in concentration camps and likening them to the Nazi Holocaust. Pompeo directly referenced Adrian Zenz, the evangelical Christian fundamentalist whose claims of forced sterilization and labor, the basis of the genocide label, have been discredited as the product of data abuse and outright fraud. In May 2020, several months before Pompeo's genocide claim, then Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs Randall Shriver suggested the number was much higher, though offered no evidence. The detention camps, uh, given what we understand to be the magnitude of the detention, uh, at least a million, but likely closer to three million uh, citizens. I asked how many people have died in the alleged concentration camps. Um, it's hard to tell uh, because the numbers China given is never, you know, trustworthy. Um, so according to the camp survivor Mikhrigul Tursun, when she was in the camp for uh, three months, nine out of 60 uh, uh, detainees were dead. Mihrigul Tursun is a Uyghur whose claims have been central to the genocide narrative and has been featured in the CIA cutout National Endowment for Democracy's promotional videos. 
She was the central witness in a Congressional Executive Committee on China hearing chaired by the neoconservative senator Marco Rubio. The very same Marco Rubio who, in 2016, denounced then-President Obama's visit to a mosque, accusing him of dividing and pitting people against each other. At the hearing, Mihrugul Tursun claimed to have had her head shaved, been tortured, and nearly killed in an electric chair, and witnessed deaths of fellow inmates. People die, it dies among us, and then I have witnessed nine people to die in front of me. Harrowing testimony to be sure, but is it factual? Well, it's hard to say. But the Chinese state media outlet CGTN caught Mihrigul Tursun lying to CNN about the death of her son. Mihrigul says police jailed and interrogated her for the next three months. The day of her release, she went to the children's hospital in Urumqi to see her infants. With evidence proving that Mihigo's children are alive, the questions are, why would she lie to CNN and how did she end up telling these lies at a U.S. congressional hearing? So the claim of Uyghurs being killed comes down to the testimony of one person whose own mother revealed to be a liar. If Mihrigul Tursun is lying, it wouldn't be the first time the U.S. government would have a sympathetic character give teary-eyed but false testimony in order to justify military aggression. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators. took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. That testimony, of course, turned out to be a lie cooked up by a member of Congress and a PR firm. Back at the rally, Rushan Abbas couldn't cite any actual figures, but insisted Uyghurs are being killed en masse. We may not know that uh, there's going to be like uh, tens of thousands of uh, dead bodies somewhere or gas chambers are happening, but everything that the Chinese government's doing in our homeland is exterminating the Uyghur people and the uh, killing the Uyghurs, basically. Both Abbas and Iltabir also claim that China has constructed crematoriums next to concentration camps, evoking imagery of the Nazi Holocaust. Also, China built crematorias around the camps. Crematorias are built next to it, uh, next to those concentration camps, for a culture that doesn't practice cremation. Right uh, there, that should give a warning signal. But unlike the Nazi death camps, there is no evidence of Chinese crematoriums. Instead, there are a handful of articles from the U.S. propaganda organ Radio Free Asia, where Abbas used to work. This Radio Free Asia article about crematoriums references claims to have aerial photos delivered by the Uyghur Transitional Justice Database, a Norway-based organization that is also funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. Yet the supposed photos of the alleged crematoriums are not provided. Instead, the article contains a blurry image of what it claims is an internment camp provided by serial fabulist Adrian Zenz and says, quote, there might be a cremation site near the camps. The Radio Free Asia article also references a previous article that alleges the regional government listed tenders for contractors to build nine, quote, burial management centers that include crematoria. A native Mandarin speaker searched the website of the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps and found nothing corroborating this claim. The same report claims the existence of a job posting listed on the Xinjiang official government website seeking 50 security personnel to work in a crematorium. There is no link to the job posting, a screenshot of any kind, or evidence of this job posting. And again, research by a native Mandarin speaker came up empty. It is, however, true that the Chinese government mandates cremation. Except this only applies to the ethnic Han majority. Ethnic minorities, including Uyghurs, are exempt. This 2003 document explains the policy, citing respect for customs of ethnic minorities and instead allots them land for cemeteries. In fact, the cover photo of the first Radio Free Asia article shows a newly constructed and weatherproof Uyghur cemetery in Xinjiang. The traditional form of dirt burials had left them vulnerable to the elements. 
Ayam koyuyup şamal çıkan bir ev topa bir ev şu tüyüşü kucuttuk. İşli tatıp git bağan, müyüşü kız git bağan. Maşında külün köyken nimilos maşı telap kırıp maşı yerini saldı. Saat beri yükü parti yükümeni rekmelik de. Biz naydı ben koyuş maşı ölge ülkünün maşı çıraylık yer yat kuzganğa. Hemen razılığımız bile şundak telap kılıp küçülüp ek aldık. Razılığımız şundak bile yerlik yattı bana. Şundak bile hatıracağım hem de. Those Radio Free Asia articles were authored by Uyghur exile Gulchera Hoja. In 2019, Hoja and Tursun were photographed proudly shaking hands with former CIA director and then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. At the rally, I asked Eltafir what she thought about the U.S. government's treatment of Muslims. Do you think like Mike Pompeo and Anthony Blinken are good allies to Muslims? I believe so. I believe so. They do uh, have strong beliefs, which we see, you know, and they do stand up for, you know, human rights. And uh, I believe they are indeed, uh, you know, from the heart, cares about humanity. Iltabir assured me that despite the U.S.-sponsored catastrophes in Muslim-majority countries like Yemen, Syria, and Palestine, the U.S. is actually taking care of their rights, and they should simply lobby congressional lawmakers like Uyghurs have. I'm sure U.S. did enough to, you know, for their rights. Uh, I, because I'm in Uyghur, uh, you know, diaspora, I read about more about those, so I may not have enough information to make a comment on that. But I would recommend those from Yemen and others to, you know, get together and do advocacy work and inform the Congress, inform the Senate, inform the uh, government officials about what's going on. And they will, if they know enough, I think they will uh, take an action. So what I suggest is for other, you know, Muslim countries to just keep, you know, doing the advocacy work, lobbying and same with like the Palestinians, for example, do yes. you think? And reach out for help, reach out for help from other groups too. Would you call what's happening in, in to the Palestinians a uh, genocide? Um, as I said, because I don't have enough information, like I don't read, I'm not up to date with what's going on. I, I'm not the right person to make that comment. When I asked Rushan Abbas why the U.S. is supposedly interested in the rights of Uyghurs while committing atrocities in Muslim-majority countries, she assured me that the U.S. is taking steps to ensure their rights. Why does the U.S. care about human rights for the Uyghur people, but not about the Yemeni people, not about the Palestinians? I'm sure that uh, they have uh, you know, other projects funding and the supporting to end those atrocities as well. She also warned that China is seeking to imprison the entire world in concentration camps. Look at the Uyghur people today and imagine the future of the free democratic world, because that's what Chinese government wants. If they win over the Uyghurs or win over the, uh, the people like uh, criticizing the Western countries or this and that, and they let us concentrate on something else and get away with what they are doing, then will be the darkness of uh, what the Uyghurs are facing, will be the future of the entire world. Finally, Abbas lashed out at Daniel Dumbrell, a Canadian vlogger based in China who she accuses of making money from the Chinese government. They are very actively using the social media, using the, uh, uh, those uh, you know, famous uh, YouTubers to spreading disinformation and the false narratives. And they are trying to uh, Who are these there is a guy, Daniel Dombriel, supposed to be Canadian, living in Shenzhen, making money from the Chinese uh, government. He has a brewing company. Well, he has a company in Shenzhen, supported by the Chinese regime, because the Chinese regime is always advertising his uh, brewing company in state-owned media. He accuses me getting paid from the U.S. government or CIA, but I'm not going to do what he's doing because I don't have evidence. But Rushan Abbas has long been on the payroll of the U.S. government and continues to be funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, a fact she didn't deny when I had brought it up earlier in our interview. What do you say to criticism about um, the funding that you've gotten and still get from the U.S. government? Because U.S. care about the human rights for the Uyghur people. While Abbas acknowledges that she doesn't have evidence that Daniel Dumbrell is paid by the Chinese government, she insisted on portraying him as its beneficiary. One thing you should think, if 
he can use YouTube and the Twitter and the social media, which none of the other people who are living in China can use. If he has a brewing company being supported and advertised by the Chinese regime, what do you say? I contacted Daniel Dumbrill, who denied Rushan Abbas's allegation that the Chinese government affords him special internet privileges and the Chinese media runs advertisements for his business. I don't think Rushan truly believes the millions of people accessing Western social media from China don't know how to use a VPN and their only option is to do favors for the Chinese government. As for her other claim, I actually made a special note that if any media outlet came to interview me about my politics or vlogging, that they not mention my business. I didn't want to conflate the two. Ironically, it's my critics that speak about my business more than I do. And this is a really good opportunity. Ask Rushan to provide any evidence for this claim and you'll find, like many of her other claims, there's just nothing there to back it up because it's simply not true. I asked the boss for evidence, but she declined to provide it, saying she is, quote, not interested in anything he had to say. Yet it wasn't only Uyghur separatist figures linked to intelligence agencies at the rally. Nihad Awad, the executive director of the Council on American Islamic Relations, attended too. We asked the Biden administration to fulfill its promise to put human rights on the top of their agenda. While on one hand defending the civil rights of Muslim Americans and refugees targeted by the U.S. government in the post-9-11 era, Kerr has also been a key proponent of destructive U.S. wars in the Middle East and North Africa. In 2011, Kerr backed the Obama administration's decision to launch a NATO regime change war on Libya, which plunged the country into chaos and brought open-air slave markets back to the African continent. In 2015, Kerr supported the U.S. dirty war on Syria, calling for a no-fly zone, a euphemism for the U.S. to shoot down Syrian and Russian military aircraft. As an American citizen, as an American Muslim citizen, I asked the Obama administration and Congress to work with key allies to establish one or no, more, more than one uh, no-fly zone to protect the Syrian population Kerr has called on its membership to pressure Congress to pass the so-called Caesar Act, the most crippling sanctions on Syria to date. These sanctions have criminalized international aid, created severe energy shortages, and caused a devastating famine. According to Foreign Policy magazine, it has brought starvation, darkness, plague, misery, robbery, kidnappings, and the destruction of a nation. Now, under the guise of humanitarianism, Kerr is throwing its weight behind the U.S.'s new Cold War against China. Dr. Talibi Sharif, the imam and president of Washington, D.C.'s historic Masjid Muhammad Mosque, attended too. We are asking that America, its government, its president, its leaders put pressure on China to treat every one of their citizens as the creation of Almighty God, the Creator, as has been identified in the precious document that establishes this country, this Declaration of Independence. Imam Sharif told me that Congress passing this legislation targeting China would be a sign of the U.S. living up to the ideals expressed in its founding documents, and he seemed to suggest the U.S. should take military action. If the U.S., for example, recognizes this Uyghur genocide and advances legislation um, to challenge it, do you think that will be a sign that the U.S. is advancing towards a more uh, harmonious, uh, you know, racially tolerant atmosphere? Absolutely will be a sign. And it's really, it's, it's the least they should be able to do. It's much more we can do. Again, I served in the military for over, over 30 years. So I know they have different instruments of, of power. But the genocide narrative was the project of former CIA director and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, one of the most extreme Islamophobes in US politics. After the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing, Pompeo remarked that Silence has made these Islamic leaders across America potentially complicit in these acts. Pompeo has accepted awards from the hate group Act for America, whose founder, Bridget Gabrielle, said that an American Muslim cannot be a loyal citizen and that Islam is the, quote, real enemy. But for Imam Sharif, Pompeo's last day genocide designation wasn't an attempt to irreversibly ramp up aggression with China, but a sign of a genuine change of heart. Why do you think someone like Mike Pompeo, um, who's you know, widely considered an Islamophobe is so serious about this issue. Well, I think, I think, I think some of that had to do with some sense of consciousness to just speak the truth. He was on his way out and he knew he was on his way out because uh, we got to look at the whole time he was in in terms of how he addressed it. And this is a short period of time. 
And uh, for him, I think in terms of consequences to him, uh, were inconsequential for him to make that statement at that particular time, even though it would go against the interests of the one that, that uh, he was representing. Uh, that's why I think that's why I think he's he said it. Uh, but again, I do I do see him as one uh, who represents uh, that right extremist population. Right. So you think just on this issue, kind of at the end, he kind of came to his senses and said, "I'm going to be in solidarity with these people." I do. I do. With little pushback, the Uyghur issue is the central component of a bipartisan push to weaken and divide China and is now at the top of Washington's foreign policy agenda.